it's time to turn to page number two. Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. I've been doing this channel for such a long time, it's a strange anomaly that I've never covered a Jimmy Page signature guitar before today. We've played Zeppelin riffs, we've talked about the Gibson USA signatures, but I'm kind of embarrassed to say I didn't even realize that there were a whole bunch of custom shop ones. So let's learn about them today. Jimmy Page, if you're not familiar, part of Led Zeppelin, kind of a big deal. A guitar hero to everyone, doesn't matter when you started playing guitar. In the 90s, signature models of an already signature Les Paul model started to become more popular, and Jimmy Page's was one of the first. From about 1995 to 1997, this is what you could get. It's a nice Gibson USA offering. Those have gotten quite expensive yet today. Jump forward about a decade in 2004, you have the reissuing of number one, that famous guitar that was gifted to him by Joe Walsh that he's used forever. If it came up for auction, it might be one of the most expensive Gibson guitars ever. Then in 2007, they did the EDS 1275, you know, the Stairway to Heaven double neck guitar. 2008, they came out with versions of his iconic three pickup Les Paul Custom with the Bigsby and all the fancy electronic switching in it. And then, announced in December of 2009 for the 2010 model year, we have what we're documenting today, the Jimmy Page number 2 Les Paul. Kind of a cool history behind this one. We just briefly mentioned Page's number 1. Page wanted a second one that felt and sounded just as good as that to take out on touring so we could have alternate tunings as well as general backup. But he ended up finding the one for him in 1973 in a shop in the UK. That was pretty much original when he first got it, but he had the neck shaved down to match number one, and he used it in the late 70s on tour, mainly for the dadgad tuning of Kashmir, he would use it on Dazed and Confused, you know, the famous violin bow guitar, as well as songs like Moby Dick and Over the Hills and Far Away. So that's all well and good, right? But the secondary history to this one is where the famous Jimmy Page wiring was born. If somebody says, hey, I did the Jimmy Page wiring conversion onto my guitar, what exactly are they talking about here? Usually they're talking about push-pull pots. Page was kind of a trailblazer in this aspect of having push-pull pots on his guitar that he had Steve Hoyland put in. So these are all your regular controls as far as volume and tones go, but these two give you series and parallel for each of the corresponding pickups, and then these ones are for coil splitting. But the fun does not end there. Did you notice that there's these little dip switches on the edge of the pick guard right here? We'll take a look on the workbench. They're just little push buttons right here. So this gives you that quacky Peter Green type of out of phase middle position. And then this is like a master series parallel switch. But that's a pretty good recap of the history of this one. However, this one was offered in three different versions, 325 being made in total. That breaks down to 25 Murphy aged page signed versions. 100 just straight up Murphy aged, and 200 VOS. Please keep in mind all the custom shop versions that we talked about earlier had a similar breakdown of the three different versions. That's what Gibson just used to do. And the full age signed versions are some of the most expensive and collectible Gibson guitars yet today. Now when I bought this, I thought I was getting one of the aged ones, but no, now I realize they call the aged page burst, as in the unique color that this one has turned into. It's got like this little dark area right there that they had to recreate. A very nice flame top. You know, it's based on a 1959. But if you come back here, what's kind of cool is it's got like that reddish cherry back. But during the neck shaving process, they must have had to have touched up the neck for some reason. <laughs> or maybe they just took the whole neck off. I don't know. But what we're documenting today is one of the VOS versions. And don't be scared just because you have tuner holes back here. The guitar originally had Clusens, so they remade that spec as they had the Grovers. And it looks like Paige is a fan of Schaller strap locks. So what a fun little piece of history, but what kind of case candy did the VOS version come with? We have a beautiful cloth COA booklet with a Jimmy Page signature on it. And then here's what the interior of that's looking like. We got Jimmy there smiling with his number two. Although it looks like we have a double white pickup in it in this particular version versus the double black. And then here we go, confirmation of it being the VOS version. And no, this is not a real signature. They're just screen printed on. But we got the Schaller counterparts as well as the truss rod tool silica packet, Gibson warranty card, as well as truss rod adjustment stuff. Ooh, look at this. That's fancy. It's got a little sheath on the inside. It just kind of shows you some of the specs as well as how many they were making. And the breakdown of all your controls here. Looks like we got all our other usual hang tags, Mr. Dealer card, the thing that used to be on the case. 
But I found this interesting. There's actually old Polaroids of this guitar. I don't think this was factory included in the case, but I bought this off of a collector who seems kind of old school. So it would not surprise me if these were the photos that were sent to him as he was purchasing it via the mail a long, long time ago before the internet got like super prevalent for selling stuff. And then of course you gotta save this. It's a little plastic sheath that just labels the guitar for you. you gotta remember Gibson wasn't doing a whole bunch of fancy electronics at this point in time. Labeling this stuff for when they had to sell it in a store does make good sense sense. And the fact that you can remove it, some guys were smart enough to keep that because these have become highly collectible. But before we throw this one on the workbench, it seems Gibson and Page for the year 2024 and beyond are going to start working together again. So who knows? We might see a number one, number two. So more than just the original 25H signs will exist. But to learn more about this one, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs before we get to a playing sample. But before we continue tonight, let's hear a word from our sponsor, Sweetwater. Sweetwater is a great place to buy new gear. From electric guitars, to pianos, to even the orchestral instruments, they have many a different ones to choose. One of my favorite things about Sweetwater when you're buying a guitar is the fact that they show you all the different tops, all the different weights, even the serial numbers. You can choose your exact guitar before they ship it to you. And by they, I mean your personal dedicated sales engineer that's going to call up and check on you, not just after the sale, but many a months down the line as well. They want to build a relationship with you. Thank you, Sweetwater, for sponsoring tonight's episode. Now let's get back to my content. It's time to uncover the secrets. So let's start with our neck pickup here. Even though it's not the full on aged version, they gave it the nice aging treatment to it. It's got a little bit of the rusting, the whole patina thing going on, but the back. How would you identify a page pickup if it was somehow removed. It looks just like a 57 Classic with the whole patent applied for decal, but it has four conductor gray wiring. Outside of taking it apart to look at the magnets, I don't know if you'd be able to tell. The neck pickup uses Alnico 2 magnets, whereas the bridge is using Alnico 5. And the backside of the bridge pickup looks very similar, but now here's where things get interesting. Our pick guard is acting as a pickup ring for other stuff. Here's the underside to one of these guards. It's kind of cool. It's got this shielding plate. Then you have these little push switches that have springs on them. So the in setting and the out setting. And then you've got a whole bunch of cable management. That way, none of this is visible from the front when the pick guard is installed. And it looks like they might glue it into place right there. But it seems like the pick guard bracket also helps secure it into place. Now, I thought I remembered reading that Paige had to like gouge out some of his top to put the originals on. That might have been a different guitar. I could be misremembering that, but there's none of that on this particular version. But how do we not see these wires? So it's not like a route in here that the wires go through to get into there. It's actually kind of cool how they did this. So when installed, no one would ever be the wiser. As far as our neck cavity, we've got a long neck tenon. Seems to be your typical construction of a late 2000s historic style Les Paul. And here's that bridge pickup cavity. The readings within the circuit, 8.42 K ohms in the bridge, 7.94 in the neck, and the mill just for fun, 4.08. You can coil split both of those to essentially have the readings in each position. And for fun, series parallel, you can see how that changes the readings within the circuit. And then the push buttons make it even more complicated. I'm not sure if this means anything to anybody. We got the main ones. Now let's talk about our bridge. It's a Gibson ABR-1, but it's like frozen on there. I'm not sure if they glued it into place or what. But you might notice, is that a bushing within the body? No, that's just a double layer of thumb wheels. That's a common modification to prevent post lean. That is how Paige specced his guitar. And for our tailpiece, our posts are nice and aged over there, but not as much on this side. Makes me think Paige might anchor right there. Here's the tailpiece itself. It's actually full weight. So maybe his is replaced on his guitar because it's not your typical lightweight aluminum. And then here's a look at our knobs. You've got your pointers or the golden bonnet. A very nice top on this one. It's got some ringy wood grain, nice even flame, but this is part of the finished job. So now that I've looked at this guitar a little bit more, I know sometimes original bursts can age into that hue, but with it only being there, I think it might actually be like an overspray situation when they did the heel. We'll just take a second to appreciate the VOS finish. I chose not to polish this one. However, it's definitely been sitting in a case for nearly 20 years, so I did give it a very light wipe down. But on VOS guitars, if you fully polish them, you're technically removing the VOS coat. So this is similar to how it would have looked new. 
Got your solid mahogany body, two-piece maple top, rosewood fretboard on a mahogany neck. We've got our nice trapezoid inlays. Board's looking nice after I conditioned it, and this one does not appear to have been played much at all. We've got our tortoiseshell side marker inlays. Well, let's capture the neck specs, 1.72 inches at the nut and 2.06 by the 12th. But check this out, 0.82 first fret neck depth, but then it's about 0.87 by the 7th. But now get this, 0.86 by the 12th. I've heard the stories about Jimmy Page's, you know, shaved neck profile. I just thought his guitars were taken down as slim as they could go before the truss rod starts. But no, the shape of the neck actually changes. It's a nice slim C shape right here. It's still rounded and nice feeling, but the farther up you go, the neck really slims out. So instead of your usual starts big and then gets bigger, it starts rounded and a little bit larger, and then really flattens out up here, you know, because he's doing all the solo and stuff. Maybe this will help just having my hand by it. So I'll keep this shape as I go up and you can see how the neck consistently gets thinner. So hugging it just kind of disappears. Gets very flat. Here that is on the contour gauge, first, seventh, and twelfth. You can see how the shape starts to visibly change. Unfortunately, you can't quite see the thinness, but that's the Jimmy Page neck profile. Moving on to the face of the headstock. Got that Gibson Mother of Pearl logo, the Les Ball model silkscreen. Truss rods looking good on this one with our standard historic style cover. And they did a nice job aging the tuners with the whole VOS finish. I could see why some people didn't go for the full on aged. A, not as expensive, and B, this looks plenty good in my opinion. Now, moving on to the back, the fun begins. I didn't even realize there was gonna be a whole bunch of stuff in here. I knew about the four push-pull pots, but they actually utilized two different ones. We have a similar brass plate on the bottom of this, and then whatever this contraption is. I'm not gonna pretend that I know exactly what all these parts are. I can at least give you a nice close-up of them if somebody's trying to replicate this. There's the markings for our volume controls. I have not seen Gibson use those ever again. However, we have seen this push-pull style before, but there's definitely a lot of wiring going on. We do still have the regular R9 stamping with a metal output jack plate, which means his was likely replaced. And again, those shallow strap locks in the usual locations. And I don't see any funny business within our toggle switch cavity. The back plates are kind of scratched up. So that might've been part of the VOS process on these. This thing is in incredibly clean condition. You know, it's got the VOS swirls and everything, but if you get it in the light, you can see a very shallow scratch right there. Possible it left the factory that way. It's probably more of like a smudge in the VOS because you don't feel it. Here you can see the thin binding in the cutaway and all the wood grain. Okay, there's a couple of case scuffs where it's been rubbing in the case like that. Although thankfully that's not on the side that you see while playing. The finish on the neck is kind of cool. It almost has like a purple hue to it when you get it in the light just right. It's not complete black. You can still kind of see through it. Except for on the side, then it gets deeper. Then continuing up our neck, you also have like a little bit more of a concentrated red area right there. Then I'm kind of surprised that they gave it the old tuner holes and the impressions of the Clusens for the VOS run. Nowadays, if they were to reissue this, the VOS would not have that. It would just come stock with the Grovers and they would save the tuner holes for the aged. But this is cool. Jimmy Page number two, and I've got a two ending in the digit, number 52. But all put back together, this one weighs nine pounds, 4.1 ounces. So let's plug it in and hear the tones of number two. fun now I'm back into the standard tuning let's try to make sense of all these tones just using a basic riff <laughs> Thank you. 
that's the coil splits? It doesn't really sound like other coil splits within Gibson's territory. It must be something to do with all that fancy wiring. It's nice. Very P90-like. Bridge. This one almost gets a bit too nasally in my opinion. Maybe if we roll the tone down. So that's the middle position with some coil splitting and being out of phase. We'll toy around with the series parallel switch. So here it is normal again. Into parallel. Kind of almost gets that coil split like tone. But the middle position's where it kind of gets fun. You can also do that with the out of phase too. I don't know how Jimmy does it. There's just so many combinations like i'm not even sure what what is the difference between this series parallel and that series parallel let's mess with that <laughs> Kind of single coil strat like sound, but without splitting, I guess we could split at the same time. But if you activate this one on top of that, it just gets extra thin. And you lose some volume. Those sound very similar to me. Maybe I don't even fully understand this guitar, even when I have the guides on it. Man, just think in the 80s how futuristic this must have been to get all these different tones out of one guitar. Let's go ahead and try some distorted stuff. <laughs>
So there we go, the custom shop VOS Jimmy Page number two. I was hoping doing this review and demo would help me understand Jimmy Page wiring and his neck profile a little bit better, but if anything, I'm just more confused at what all these different tones meant to Jimmy. But if you're not interested in fiddling around with your tones, you can always just run it regular. Just make sure you have everything in the regular positioning. And let's just say good luck if you don't have these original window clean type things for it. So in places like Sweetwater say they'll do the Jimmy Page wiring mod for you, it's not exactly this, but it's something a little bit easier to understand. The neck profile, I totally understand now. A bit thin for my style, but I'm not really doing much immediately wiggly stuff. So, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed. If you're interested in being the next owner of this particular number two, you can find it for sale on my website, trogleysguitarshow.com. All right, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.